So I want to welcome you all to the launch of uh, this report, uh, Displacement, Housing and Homelessness in Northern Manitoba Communities. Uh, I co-authored co -authored this report with Marlene Bonnie Castle, uh, and uh, we're so pleased that you can be here. Uh, I acknowledge this webinar <clears throat> is broadcasting uh, from Treaty 5 territory and Treaty 1 territory and the homeland of the Métis people. I am speaking to you uh, from Thompson on the traditional lands of the Sikh-Dewayasik uh, Cree Nation on Treaty 5 territory. We acknowledge the harms of colonization. Uh, this research is one way uh, we're trying to address these and to move forward in partnership uh, in truth and reconciliation. This report is an effort to end uh, by working with First Nations and Indigenous communities, uh, or to this end, pardon me, by working with uh, First Nations and Indigenous communities to document, document displacement and problems of homelessness and identify community-based uh, responses to this. We acknowledge the support of our university, uh, really appreciate, of course, the support from the MRA, but also our university uh, when conducting this collaborative research. And I just want to give a nod to the University uh, of Manitoba's Northern Social Work Program. So the agenda today, uh, we're going to start off this event in a good way. I'm hoping Agnes is here. Agnes is on. All right. Uh, we're going to start this off in a good way uh, with a traditional welcome from Elder Agnes Spence. Uh, then Lori Dean uh, will speak about uh, the Manitoba Research Alliance and uh, the Indigenizing Thompson Project that helped uh, to support this research. Uh, then Lou Moody, uh, the chair of the NCN Housing Committee, and I will discuss the project. And finally, Marlene is going to lead you, uh, facilitate a bit of a discussion with you. Uh, to close us off. So now I'm honored to introduce Elder Agnes Spence. Agnes has held many roles in her community. She's from Mississippi, uh, and she's also an ordained minister who provides services in the, in the region. So welcome, Agnes, and thank you uh, for... Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, we'll do our prayer now. An opening prayer. Let us pray. Pray to God, our Heavenly Father, we place the hours and the events of this day in your hands. We trust in your presence through every moment. We pray for your care and guidance in the coming day. O oh, Creator God, our Heavenly Father, we ask you to keep us safe in your arms as we trek through this uncertain times of our lives. The uncertain times of this coronavirus. Be with us, bless us, keep us safe. We thank you, O Creator God, for the blessings of this life. And we ask you to continue to be with us, continue to bless us with all that is good. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey. Thank you, Agnes. So, uh, so Lou uh, and myself are going to have a bit of a discussion, uh, and Agnes may also join in with us. Uh, both Marlene and I are so grateful we have the opportunity to do this project here in northern Manitoba. Uh, this research could not have been completed uh, without the contributions and support from so many people. Uh, but uh, you know, most especially the two elders for this project, Agnes Spence, uh, who you just heard speak, and Jack Robinson, who is with Mama Wuta Friendship Center in Thompson, Manitoba. And uh, the two of these elders uh, played an important role in guiding us uh, in, through the completion of this research. Lou has also been a significant advisor and support for this research. And I'm going to turn it over you, to you, Lou, to introduce yourself a bit more. Lou, can you hear things? Are you able to speak? Is that my cue? It's your cue to introduce yourself. Hello? Yes, please. Ooh. Just so people know there's a bit no, of a lag. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear, can you hear me? Okay. I, I guess from my perspective, 
Um, let me introduce myself first and foremost. Uh, again, my name is Lou Moody, uh, and I've been the uh, I've been on the housing board for the past 12 years. And within that board, I, I was uh, I'm, I'm still the chair, and I've come to learn and understand, and realize what our needs, what the actual needs are within our community, all encompassed in university, not just one specific aspect, but we're trying to deal with everything from a global global perspective here in our community. Uh, the one thing I want to share with you is a historical overview and I've always maintained from day one that when our people were displaced uh, along the river banks um, and when Canada basically identified IR 170, they re relocated our people but with no commitment, with no future commitment of our children, basically, I, I'm, I'm basically one of them. And that's one of the things that I need to bring up first and foremost is that irresponsible uh, relocation of our people because there was no funding commitments uh, given. Um, and the corporation that we, we have here, we had here in Nelson House was uh, the Hudson Bay Company. And they basically uh, plotted their their piece of property right in the middle of our reserve, which uh, to make a long story short, they basically went in there and took that piece of property, uh, provided food for our people, took uh, money from our people. And at the end of the day, they, they were trespassing for 99 years. That's a pet peeve that I have. But uh, the point I wanna make uh, as it relates to the homelessness, uh, I just shared, I just shared uh, the pictures with you, Leanne, I just came from our uh, 24, 24 unit project. We call it the Mobitale unit. And I'll tell you, it's a beautiful sight to see for those people to make that transition from where they were to where they are now. It's uh, optimism plays a big role in it and the belief for everybody that's in that unit is something else. So I'll just conclude with that for now. And, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. I have a lot more to, to give, so, Deanne? Thanks so much, Lou. Uh, sorry? Did you hear me? Oh, you know what, I totally forgot to introduce. <laughs> Did you hear me? Yes, you know, we totally started, forgot to start with Lori. Uh, sorry, Lou. So I just launched, uh, sorry, you guys, I'm a little nervous at this and uh, this coming to me, uh, this introducing the whole thing kind of came to me a little late. So we need to backtrack, Lou. And let Lori speak. And I just want to introduce Lori Dean, uh, and he's going to yep. talk to us about the MRA. Sorry, Lori. Yeah, that's no no problem at all, Leanne. And Lou, thank you. Uh, that's a really actually very fitting introduction to this whole project. So I uh, appreciate those comments very much. Yeah, so I was just asked to say a few words about the Manitoba Research Alliance. Uh, and the vision of John Loxley. Um, John Loxley was head of the economics department for many years at U of M and uh, really a world renowned economist. And, um, but you know, it was as common to see John at a community meeting, um, trying to iron out a problem with a board difficulty or funding difficulty or trying to get housing for people in the inner city of Winnipeg, as it was to at, say, a World Bank conference on economic development. So, so John was a very grassroots person, a very, um, very committed person to social justice. Uh, very sadly, John passed away on July 28th this year. Um, huge loss to our community, huge loss to our, our province, I think. But uh, the reason we're just mentioning John and his vision is that John started back in the early 2000s applying to the Social Science and Research, Humanities Research Council for very large grants to do research in community economic development, housing, justice, and training for young people. And uh, these, were, these were significant grants, two and a half million, five million at one point. I think the last one we had was 3 million. Um, and John pulled together a network of somewhere between 20 and 40 
researchers. It's hard to number them because it was a rather fluid um, network, but all researchers basically with a commitment to social justice. And um, I should say, by the way, John was brought to the province of Manitoba by Africa from England in his very early 30s uh, by the first NDP government ever elected in Manitoba. And John, John was brought here specifically a plan for economic development for the North. And, and John, it, you can still read this plan online. It's called the Great Northern Plan by John Loxley. And basically he headed up something called the Resource and Economic Development Secretariat of Government. And they planned out a self-reliance model for development for Northern communities, particularly indigenous communities. So John spent four years on that. Uh, the plan was developed and unfortunately, politically, the NDP didn't see it as um, beneficial to move ahead with the plan, but that was the kind of um, vision that John had and was brought here to Manitoba with. Um, as I said, we've had four of those grants from the Humanities and Research Council, um, and we've had 20 to 30 academics constantly for almost 20 years now doing research on social justice issues. We've just uh, obtained another grant, which will now go for seven years. So hopefully more of this research can move forward. At the tail end of our last grant in 2019, um, there was still $200,000 left. And most of the researchers were busy with projects. So John was looking for a way to allocate the final amount of money and um, was aware that the indigenous population of Thompson had gone from in over one census period from 37% to 43%. Um, not only that, but the mine was closing down, the smelter had already closed. Um, so there was this very large transition taking place in Thompson uh, where the majority population was becoming indigenous and you know the massive economic presence of Valley was diminishing. So um, John thought to allocate this two hundred thousand dollars to uh, researchers in Thompson to really explore what the implications of of these changes might be. Uh, we had a couple of meetings with twenty or thirty uh, researchers in Thompson, and so. Uh, the project you're going to hear about today, uh, this homelessness project that Leanne and uh, Marlene and Lou have worked on, is one of the projects out of that indigenizing of Thompson um, kind of vision. And um, there were a couple more that came out of it, uh, an archiving project for which helped communities across the north to be able to archive some of their records. And then there was a research project on Nisi Chawasik um, the housing and the training that's happening at APEC there. Um, so uh, th some significant academic and um, widely distributed research did come out of that project and we hope we will follow up on it in the coming seven years of the current grant. So that's just a little bit about um, the funding for this project and the vision of John Loxley and um, uh, I've had a chance to read this report, and this is an exceptional example of the kind of research that the MRA has been able to do. So over to you, Leanne, Marlene, Lou. Thank you so much for your kindness and patience. Um, uh, so, uh, and such a great job. We were so appreciative of, uh, you know, the support that we received from the MRA and um, and uh, we're hoping that this does contribute. So Lou has done his introduction, so, so I'm just going to introduce myself a little. I'm a relative newcomer to Northern Manitoba. Um, I've lived in Thompson now since the summer of 2016, and uh, I moved from Northern BC uh, where I was working in healthcare. I came here to teach uh, in the Northern Social Work Program. And thanks so much to Marlene and Colin Bonnie Castle, who was my director at the time. Uh, they helped me so much to get connected in this community and uh, 
uh, dragged me, <laughs> dragged me into some research, uh, which led to this project. Uh, I've developed many connections in the region, and that's very much thanks to my students who come from uh, many of these communities up here. And um, uh, so Lou and I are going to provide a short description of the project and our involvement, and Agnes is also welcome. Uh, she's still on to join in because she uh, has contributed so much uh, to the development of it. Uh, and next, we're going to talk about the, you know, the housing situation, uh, the impacts of colonization, services and supports in the region, the importance of relationships, and some things that can be done. And all of this, of course, we learned uh, from the people who gave of their time in interviews and in focus groups and community cafes. So there have been several research projects that came before us that are very important, made important contributions in the past few years. Uh, they've been tr contributed to our understanding about homelessness and the development of, uh, and, and have developed relationships in the community of Thompson that are very important to some of you on this call. Uh, I recognize your names. I know that you've been involved in those other projects. So thank you for being here. Uh, this project was developed over two years in two communities, Joasic and Thompson. The main goal we had for the project uh, was to explore people's experiences uh, with housing and homelessness uh, in both communities toward increasing our understanding and uh, also, of course, uh, to encourage improvements uh, that will be helpful to people. So Lou, you kind of gave a little bit about why you, you were part of the project. Did you want to say some more? why you thought it was important? Well, I guess, yeah, I guess to begin, um, as it relates to our con the conditions of our homes and the, the amount of people that are in the homes, some homes have 10, 15, and one house that I visited yesterday had 18 people in one house. Now, what does that create? You ask yourself that one question. What does it create? Well, what it creates is an overcrowded to use a washroom. You have people waiting to eat. You have people um, doing shifts to sleep four hours or allow, to allow another sibling to sleep the four hours. So we look at the psychological element as it relates to uh, I'll get to the, the homeless aspect of it later, but I want to give you the big picture and the reality that we're faced with in society right across the board. When that happens, you ask it, uh, Canadian, the Canadian society basically says, why are there so many people incarcerated of Aboriginal or Indigenous descent, right? That's a question that's always been asked. Well, I'll walk you through it. As I alluded to, the overcrowded situation that we're faced with. In one twin bed, there's four people sleeping sardine style. And with, with, no, with no knowledge of the individual kicking a sibling on the face, the heel of their, using their heel. So right off the hop, you look at, you, you get up grumpy, figuring that it was intentional, which, which it wasn't. You wake up to use the washroom, frustration. You wait to eat. If there's any food left over, you go to school empty or with an empty stomach then you look at uh, somebody saying something to you that's not a sibling you don't hesitate because you just eat the crap out of your siblings so that's where it all starts from okay then the incarcerated incarceration happens at some point in time they lose the the concept of well, I, i'm no good i give up on life blah 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 so they resort to drinking uh, uh, to drugs and basically there's caught in a place that initially they did not want they did not want to be at a situation where they're away from their home they're away from their community and what happens uh, during the time frame that they're engaging in the concept of homelessness it's it's created and there's the shit around chatting with each other and all of a sudden they belong they belong somewhere and they don't start want to talking cut you off, and start Lou, what you're saying is so important surrounding communities and all of a sudden yeah yep so, hey lou so so we're, we're going to get to a lot of that so, remember 
Yeah. So thank you for that. Can we can we keep going okay. forward and get it? Because remember, we've got such a limited time. Yep. And uh, I know you have a lot to say. So I want to I want to support Please. that. So uh, so uh, as okay. As Lou was saying, um, you know, there's a lot in this research uh, that resonated with uh, recent research in Canada, uh, where it's recognized that the commonly held notions about homelessness aren't a good fit for Indigenous people. And uh, um, particularly uh, when you look at uh, the Indigenous, uh, the definition of Indigenous homelessness that was authored by Jesse Thistle, you can find that at the Canadian Observatory on Homelessness. Uh, he talks about uh, homelessness uh, is a condition for Indigenous people where they have been isolated from their relationships to land, water, place, family, kin, uh, each other, animals, cultures, languages, and their indigeneity. Participants talked about colonization and how this history has impacted on their lives in many uh, different ways. And, and you were going to talk a bit, Lou, I thought about, uh, you know, what you learned when you looked at the history. Well, I basically alluded to the fact, as it relates to history, that Canada has an obligation uh, for the displacement of our people that created one, IR-170. But the one thing I want to touch up on, Leanne, is, is very important. We talked about this, and, and that's the mere concept of how, how does it transpire? How does homelessness transpire? Well, it transpires from the concept of the overcrowded situation that they're faced with then eventually get pushed out, out into the community somewhere else. So they go, then all of a sudden they start couch surfing, okay? Mm -hmm. And when they're sleeping there, they really don't have a say as to what goes on there. They can't focus their attention on anything that they want to do to better themselves. They try, and if they try and say something within that household, they'll get kicked out and they'll move on again and again and again. Um, but the, the crucial thing that we have to understand is uh, our people, our people want to belong. They, they want to belong somewhere. And they have found that. They are, unfortunately, it's outside in Thompson. But the one thing that we talked about yesterday, well, how do we pull them out of there? How do we, how do we uh, condition them? Or how do we, um, what was the word we used? Um, transition them away from homelessness. Well, you know what, it's gonna be very hard. That's a big task that we have. I just sent you some pictures of a beautiful facility that we care about in our First Nations. It's 24, uh, a 24 unit, we call it a mobile unit, but that's where our, our homeless people uh, live now. Yeah. It took so a while and people are starting to see pictures. the camaraderie, the belonging is back. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, Lou, for you whatever didn't? reason, I didn't get those yet. So it might okay, well, you go ahead and comment. And I'll, I'll... Okay. All right, so we heard, uh, you know, okay, yeah, as, as Lou was alluding but, to, there but... isn't enough housing. Sorry, Lou, I'm, did you want to say more? Okay. So there isn't enough housing yeah. for young families, youth, and no, elderly communities. Sorry? There's this delay, which makes it difficult. And the result is that there's too many people living under, under one roof. And you're talking about that. You're talking about the overcrowded housing. We also learned too many people have nowhere to go in communities. And that's when, uh, you know, some of your work, NCN decided uh, to try to do something about that. So they've put together these uh, modular homes uh, that are kind of acting as a homeless shelter in the community. But the community in recent years has also developed uh, the uh, women's shelter in the community. And this is this is something, you know, it's a, NCN is really building up uh, and trying to respond, uh, not, ju not just to uh, their economic well-being, but their social well-being within the community. So, uh, but I think you alluded to that as well. You talked about how difficult it is for people to live precariously and how living uh, without a secu secure place uh, gets in the way of, uh, you know, important things. Uh, like, uh, you know, going to school, being employed, or engaging in community. So I don't know if you wanted to say more about the housing situation, Lou? Well, I, I guess I can conclude by saying we need to do more. Mm -hmm. we, need, we need to be innovative. We need to try and uh, 
first and foremost for, for the First Nations right across Canada, they need to establish a policy with the board, not one or the other. It has to be yeah. both. I guess that's where you could start. And by having the, the general rules or the, the, the rules of engagement as it relates to uh, being able to live in a house um, can come through fruition. Fairness plays a big role in it, right? The policy and the board and the composition of your board is crucial. Um, because within our board, we have a, a police officer, welfare, um, welfare worker. Um, I'm the recreation director. Uh, uh, the composition is very important. But the one thing that needs to happen is we need to look at, look at each other and say, what can we do? We have, our, our chief and council has taken the initiative to do what it, what it takes to make a better tomorrow for each and every person that lives in our First Nations. We have a backlog of 450 homes. Mm. You and I know that we will never catch up and that's where sustainability comes into play. I'm proud to say that our First Nation, uh, we own the Mystery Lake Hotel, we own the, the Trappers, we own the gas station in Thompson. We need to do that. We need to keep uh, pushing money back into our community so that way we can hopefully at some point in time catch up with the backlog. And I know it's universal right across Canada, but we got to start doing something. Yeah. Those are thank my concluding you. marks. And I thank yeah. each and every one of you for listening. Oh, don't go anywhere. We still have more to do, Lou. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> so, uh, so there's a lots of barriers. I'm not going anywhere. Not... <laughs> okay, good. There's lots of barriers, not just in, uh, in, in MCN. Uh, there's lots of barriers in Thompson and other cities uh, across Canada, as you're saying, it isn't that far. But in Thompson, uh, and, and we heard from people who were interviewed that processes getting housing can be very confusing for them. Uh, people don't always have the knowledge and the resources they need to be able to navigate these systems in cities. And uh, participants in Thompson also talked about trying to get housing and being told uh, there wasn't any housing available or how their application was lost. Uh, they talk about uh, not feeling welcomed, feeling judged, and, and often perceived uh, that they were this was happening wherever they tried to uh, seek out supports. So I don't know Lou, if you want to talk a little bit about the challenges that people have when they go into Thompson. Was that question directed to me, uh, Leanne? It was. Did you want to speak a little bit about uh, the challenges that people are having, the barriers that they're experiencing when they go into Thompson? Well, first, I guess first and foremost, uh, there's a lot of people that uh, do go there that don't have the knowledge as to where to go for help. That's one. And even when they do get the necessary, the necessary help that is required, whether it be step by step or anything like that, uh, nine times out of 10, it's too philosophical for them. But when an individual basically asks for help, they'll just nod their head and say, yep, yep. Do you understand? Yep, I do. Because again, uh, the psychological element related to, well, I wanna get back to my buddies. I wanna get my, back to my group. Uh, behind the TI or behind uh, wherever, right? So um, time, the one thing I found out about a lot of our people is they don't really have time um, to asso associate with you because they'll come and say, well, uh, hey, Lou, um, you have five bucks I can borrow. Okay, give them the five bucks, he's gone, right? Okay. So, when I was speaking with a few people, they basically alluded to the fact that, you know, it's nice to see you, I'll see you later. Because their focus is somewhere else, right? And, and that's where the problem lies, right? The alcohol that they do buy, the drugs that they're associated with, right? So, and to try and get help, it's like pulling their teeth. Uh, if you sit down, if you do bring them to a table and say, okay, I wanna help you. These are the things that I want you to do, right? So, and that's why I allude to the fact of the transition um, because they get so, the, there's a bond there. There's a right. sense of belonging there, right? 
And they really don't want to leave that yeah. because. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's such an important point. And I think well, that, but people also talk about. That, it, yeah. It's a, We're, we've lost you, Lou. I don't know what's happening. You're kind of cutting in and out and your video is gone. So I'm just going to go forward. And when you show back up. Just yeah, like, I'm having a hard time hearing you, Leanne. Yeah, I, I can hear that and I can see that. And I'm sorry. Yeah, I have a, so, uh, you know, if this is this is the experience, right? There's low bandwidth in the communities here in the north, and it makes it very challenging for us to use this technology. So uh, thank you all out there for your patience. So if it's okay, we will just sort of go forward a bit more. So, uh, so participants in the project, uh, and I have something to share here, just sort of a visual for you. Uh, you can see all the communities across the north. There's the orange arrow. Uh, that's where uh, the participants who uh, were included came from, and some from the most northwestern corner of, uh, of our region. Uh, their journeys from these communities were, of course, precipitated by needs uh, for housing, uh, safety, supports, and sometimes, though, they were also seeking opportunities uh, that, of course, can't be provided for in their communities. Uh, participants told us there was a really, there's a really big gap uh, when they experienced a crisis in a community, whether it was a result of family violence, uh, mental health, or substance use, or a fire. And I guess. You know, that's why it's so exciting what uh, NCN is doing, where they're trying to fill these gaps in their community with services so people don't have to leave. Are you back, Lou? Okay. So, um, one participant talked about being removed from his community after a house fire where he'd been severely injured. Uh, he stated he was part of the 60s group, uh, that he remained in care from the age of three to about 14 years of age, not having any connection with his family during that time or the community. When things started breaking down in foster care, he was returned to the community to live with his sister, but this broke down because there wasn't enough room for him in, in that home. So he ended up having to move in with another relative in a completely different community in the region. You can see how spread apart things are. So uh, sadly, at that time where he moved to, uh, there was a lot of alcohol use in the home, and uh, and he's, he started to drink and said that, you know, that that's really what eventually led into his homelessness at, at, at an early age. So I don't know, Lou, if you're there and you want to speak to people's reasons for leaving community. I, I can't hear you. Do you want yeah? to speak, speak to people's I can't hear reasons you. for leaving community? You know what? I'm going to phone in. Okay? okay. That's a good idea. Thank you. I'm going to phone in. Okay. So close out of okay. this, though, so it doesn't give us a real lot of noise <laughs> when you come back. All right. So uh, the thing is, too, that uh, people said when they do come into cities like Thompson that, um, that uh, services, uh, uh, well, they're difficult to navigate, navigate but um, they're not heard, they're not listened to, and uh, uh, that uh, people don't seem interested in getting to know them and know their stories. And one participant showed me a long list of things that she had been given uh, by her worker. She told me she had to get these things done before she could move on to whatever the next step was going to be. And, um, you know, she was, of course, uh, going to be, she was, she was going to be discharged from where she was uh, back to the homeless shelter. And it's hard to imagine that she would be able to accomplish those things, uh, you know, with all, the only thing she could carry is what, you know, she could carry in her pockets. So um, uh, some of the list of things were abstaining from substances, going back to college. So the message we got from quite a few oh, participants, uh, you know, fits with uh, fits with uh, uh, what we know uh, about uh, the need for harm reduction responses, where um, you know people uh, are met where they're at, um, and and that didn't seem to be happening here. 
So uh, they also talked about the fact that they aren't able to, even if they try to engage with people, there's no space for them to do that in Wisconsin. Um, that they're expected to sit down at a very public table in the homeless shelter uh, to talk to service providers about their needs. And uh, so that no privacy. And you know, one interview participant most motioned around the research office where we were doing the interview and, and said, you know, there needs to be some place like this that we can go to. Uh, to have a conversation with somebody. So uh, people living without uh, shelter in Thompson and 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 Sienna, of course they also leave the region. We talked about going to places like Winnipeg, Vancouver, Toronto, uh, but they always come back. Uh, and they and the reason they said they were coming back or that they were staying without housing here is that they're connected here. And um, this is their home ter territory. This is where their community is, and it's where they have relationships. Uh, they come back and they stay, whether there's uh, housing here for them, as I said. So uh, people's relationships, their connections, hold them to the region, to each other. Participants told us we help each other out, uh, the folks who are on the street, and also in the community. Uh, use those same, that, those same kind of words. We help each other out. Several people who were interviewed had been living uh, homeless on the street or at the, ch at the shelter for many years. There was one um, person who had been homeless for 25 years uh, living at the shelter. Um, a couple of participants also claimed that they weren't homeless though, and this was important, it became important to us as we thought about it. Uh, they stated, uh, not uh, a couple said it stated that it was their homeland, uh, but but one person, uh, you know, very emphatically said we should stop calling it the homeless shelter, it's people's home. And, uh, you know, that's something that we should be thinking about. Some people who were interviewed talked about those who forego shelter uh, for family or to be um, uh, with their family who are living on the street. So those relationships and connections are, you know, we need to have consideration for that. And I think, um, you know, it's a real challenge if, you know, if if people are going to live on the street, of course, they are going to form those connections and relationships. And, uh, you know, it, it may not uh, be an easy transition for them into housing uh, if they're if the people they care about are still on the street. And we, we heard that very clearly. So is Lou back, uh, Andre? Can you see him getting back in? Okay. So, um, um, all right, so though people connect with each other well, they're experiencing homelessness, they also continue to have, to have relationships with their families and communities. And Lou kind of alluded to that, that people are talking to each other uh, when, uh, when people come in from the outlying communities. Uh, they're often bringing each other uh, things to help to make their lives a little bit easier. Um, but they also talked about uh, how reconnecting with community might inspire them to reconstruct their lives. So. This is an interesting and curious thing about you know what that would look like how we might be able to support that better many people talked about uh, uh, the need to understand to educate people about the history and uh, that's why in the report we did a little bit of that we talked about some of the history and I really go into that. I didn't talk about Thompson. Thompson is uh, as Lori uh, spoke to it is a uh, a mining town. Uh, it was built in the 1950s. And, um, you know, at that time, there was really no consideration for people who've been living there for thousands of years, as has been the case for resource development across Canada. And um, though people, the people, the local people, uh, people from uh, Nisituasic and other communities in the region came and helped to build the town, in those early days, they weren't able to live in the community. Uh, they weren't, they also weren't able to work at the mine. So understanding that history is very important and, and many people don't know it or have forgotten it. Uh, today, uh, I think Lori spoke to that as well, nearly 50%, some people argue, uh, more than 50% of the people in the community are Indigenous. So, uh, so educating people about the history, uh, we learned uh, part of that history is that housing in the communities though, has been imposed without much consideration for the environment or how people live there, yeah, live in the houses. Participants talked about how people used to be able to take care of their own housing and how the community would build housing when it was needed. 
you know, there was there was no waiting around for this. They would just get together and do it if a young family needed, the, needed housing. The housing met their needs, and uh, uh, and and if it didn't, they tore it tore it down and built something else. Uh, but the housing today just isn't a good fit uh, for how people live. And um, if Lou are, is Lou back, I see. So I'm, I'm back. Yeah. So Lou, do you want to talk a bit about uh, the housing and how? Um, you know, it's not been a good fit for the people. It, well, the material that we receive from um, from whatever lumber company that uh, we do get lumber from is not adequate, is not uh, conducive to the weather, to the condition of the weather in northern Manitoba. So in essence, what usually winds up happening is the, the houses usually start deteriorating. But one of the one of the important things that needs to be noted as it relates to housing is again I'll refer back to the policy that we do have. The policy is driven by the board, and the, the, the people are basically the driving force of the board that exists because there's on constant communications. Having said that, we have, we basically try to uh, facilitate or accommodate our people the best way we can. We, Instead of building matchbox houses, like we have to be very innovative as it relates to housing, because CMAC is also it's all about social housing, and if it's not about social housing, they want uh, they want to gouge people of uh, 25% of their income, and a lot of people are, have been reluctant in the past to enter into an agreement with CMAC. So in, the, in essence, what they wind up doing is they wind up waiting for banned housing. And that usually doesn't take, well, it usually takes a long, long time to be able to get money historically. But now we've become very innovative in the sense of a lot of our working class people, because our people are coming slowly coming home, but they can't stay long because they're tired of living in an overcrowded situation that's not their home. So in essence, they basically say, well, I'm, uh, if I don't get a house, I'm seeing you later. So we had to become we had to manipulate uh, the operating agreement as it relates to CMHC in the sense that. Sorry, Lou, are you still there? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Is, am I ph phasing out or, 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 or what? Yeah, you dropped off for some reason, yeah. Yeah, okay. But anyway, the, the bottom line of the whole thing is we, we, uh, every First Nations has to be innovative in the sense of re revisit the operating. Oh, you're gone again. There's, I, I don't know what's going on. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. It, I don't know. Cut now. All right. So, so, um, so people had a lot of ideas, right? Um, you were there, Lou, in the focus group uh, and the cafe uh, in NCN and uh, in, in those focus groups in the cafes in, uh, or, or cafe, I should say, focus groups uh, in uh, Thompson. Uh, the biggest one, the number one was one was ensuring that there's enough housing uh, for people. And, and we all know what a gap that is across uh, our country and uh, across the province. Uh, and participants in both communities saw the need for people to come together and learn about the history and get involved in change processes. And uh, um, they talked about coming together in community meetings and some of this work uh, has been happening a little in NCN. People, there have been some meetings already. Yes, there has. And as I alluded to, like we, I guess to, to begin with, our our our, um, our final financial resources are the investments that we put in to the Mystery Lake, uh, the the gas bar, and the trappers. Uh, but here at home, we also built our own store. Uh, we've built the, uh, the. I'm hoping you've got those pictures of our 24 unit uh, mobile unit. Um, we, we cater to our people that are homeless. Uh, we have a homeless shelter. We also have a, a medicine lodge. And just recently, we built a multiplex. So the, the leadership is really trying their best to accommodate our people, but it's all about networking. It's all about working together. When you, uh, and there's a lot of First Nations that, uh, you know, I, I've seen in the past where people just don't want to work with each other. And if we don't work with each other, we can't get ahead. 
if we can't get ahead, we're going to start creating what we have now, and that's homeless people in Thompson. And because they're from surrounding communities in northern Manitoba, they're they're not just from one area. They're they're probably about six. Uh, that map that you uh, identified, Leanne. Yeah. Well, there's about what, 15, 20? Yeah, there were eleven so, communities represented uh, that participants were from. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So in Thompson, they also talked about the need to develop policy, but in Thompson, it was more about protecting uh, what affordable housing exists and also about prioritizing people for housing. Um, and this came up in a myriad of different ways uh, for, for the communities as well, for the Indigenous communities, uh, some challenges around prioritizing people. I mean, um, I thought, uh, maybe I misheard it, but I thought, uh, the housing board there was working on a strategic plan, and a part of that was uh, some kind of priority list for people. Well, we, we've uh, we've created the ally uh, of the city of Thompson, the mayor and council of uh, the city of Thompson, and they're they're basically in favor as to what uh, NCN wants to do. Uh, we had that exactly here. Of homelessness, and uh, she's pretty adamant, and she she wants to help uh, the best way they can. Yes, and yeah. likewise with us. But oh, no, almost forgot. Yeah, and there was a lot, a lot of discrimination to our people uh, because yeah. they they used every every excuse in the book not to give any units to our people, mm -hmm. and and that we got wind of it and. Uh, we did something about it to basically tell the, the landlords of the city of Thompson to say, you know what, don't look at the color of the individual. You know, there's a need and want. There's a parent and there's four children here. Look at that first before you look at the color of the person's skin. Yeah. So I've had to say that on yeah. several occasions to individuals. Yeah. So but it, it, it exists to go slowly, slowly. Uh, our people are, you know, because of our situation, they, they got no choice but to move to Thompson. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of our people that are living in Thompson now. And the discriminating factor is, is slowly, slowly disappearing. I know it's always going to be there, but you know what? It's not as bad as, as it was in the past. Yeah. That was another option. Yeah, that's so important what you're saying. And, uh, and Mayor Colleen Smook has been so uh, supportive of the work that is ongoing uh, in the community. So, and, it is, and it's great to hear that those conversations have been happening uh, with the landlords in Thompson. And I guess it's important uh, to say too, that so many people commute from Thompson uh, to work in NCN, uh, because like you said, there's no housing. Yeah, you're right, there's a lot. Yeah, there's no housing. So we're, we're getting, you know, we're really getting into what can be done. And um, uh, so certainly this idea of having a conversation uh, in, in NCN and other communities, a conversation here in Thompson, but there's also uh, this idea that uh, maybe we could, because uh, there, was, there was a lot of talk about, uh, you know, uh, possibly doing things like cultural exchanges or uh, somehow bringing together the communities uh, to have this this conversation around housing. You want to talk about that a bit, Lou? Well, one again, uh, evolving around the word discrimination. One of the things that I want to make mention of is that obviously we're partners with Manitoba Hydro when we created that dam in Wisconsin. But one of the requirements for you to work at Wisconsin was you had to take this cross cross cultural yeah. uh, workshop. And that was very important. And uh, it was an initiative that was started by uh, our past leaders. And uh, to, to date, as we speak now, it's almost a prerequisite for that to happen. So if we hire any contractors from the outside, they have to understand what uh, who we are, what our needs are, and understand that we have a treaty document that was signed by Her Majesty and uh, our chief, uh, Pierre Moose, from 1908. We go as far as back, so there's no misconceptions as to, well, why are these guys not paying taxes? That is the biggest that that is the biggest misconception a lot of people had in the past. But now, 
uh, I'm, I'm being optimistic that a lot of people know who we are. So we're nearly at the end of our time. Like we just have a minute, Lou, and I just want to give you the last word. Um, you know, we talked about, uh, you had a lot, of, lot to say to me yesterday about what needs to happen. And like, for instance, you talked about uh, you know, how we need, need to make sure our language uh, is appropriate, uh, but also that there is reciprocal relations uh, uh, in, in any work that goes forward. Uh, and it all starts with listening and relating uh, at the level the person is at. Did you want to speak to that very quickly? Yeah, um, from our educational standpoint here on, at home, uh, we've actually produced a book of uh, a book that is all Cree. Mm. Uh, you have you have uh, you have the English word, you have a Cree word right beside it. Um, it's a unique, uh, it's a beautiful book that was produced by uh, uh, William Dumas and his crew, the elders right. from down at the Education Authority. Right. But yeah, but the, the bottom line of the whole thing is, if we want this to uh, to disappear sometime in in the near future. What we have to do is you, you hit the nail on top of the head. You've got to listen. You've got to listen to what's being said. But more importantly, the thing that needs to happen is you have to network with as many people, as many organizations, corporations, whatever the case might be, to basically say, you know what, we have a problem here. Can you be part of the solution? And by networking, you can go far. That is, those are basically my concluding remarks. Thank it's all so about me better tomorrow. Thank you so much, Lou. And we, you know, we didn't get to talk about everything that we wanted to talk about because, gosh darn it, there's a limited time, but also the star technology. So I'm going to hand it over now to Marlene uh, to facilitate uh, a bit of a conversation uh, with the people who have joined us on the call. And already there's been some questions. I don't know, uh, Andre, if you want to share those or how we're going to do this. Turning it over to you, Marlene. Uh, hmm. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for your attendance. Thank you, Liana and Louis, for your presentation. I think it was very inspirational. Uh, although the limitation of the technology, but this is part of the North. This is part of working in Northern communities. Uh, that is maybe this is part that people from the South needs to understand what is happening. And I think I really appreciate your efforts to do this uh, presentation today. And thank you, MRI, for the whole support and Lori. Um, I, all, I always have in my mind the memory of John Losley about talking about housing, about the whole issues, about the the solutions that came from the South that are not necessarily what people in the North need and want. And I think this report is giving us some perspective about uh, what, what people want and how people see the reality that live and like that. And thank you, Louis, for your comments. I think that very important to understand. Um, Eloy, you at some time you say that we need to do more. And also you said we need to be innovators. What do you mean with that? Could you expand a little bit on that? You want me to repeat the question, Louis? Please. Okay. So you said that sometime in your presentation at the beginner, uh, you say we need to do more and we need to be innovators. And I want you oh. to tell us more about what you mean with that. And why did you want other people in this uh, webinar? Um, to listen about what you think about. See, uh, is a, does it really allow 
uh, working class people to come in there because well, actually. It's hard to hear you. Yeah, I, th I think he's uh, fading out, Marlene. I think we might have to. Hello? Yeah, Lou, can you, can you speak about what you meant when you said that there needs to be innovation? Anyway. Uh, I think it's a limitation by the time maybe we reconnect with the uh, uh I want to hear if there is any question from the audience. And I think there is a feature for the hands or no? Or just jump? Well, there already were some questions. Uh, I thought I saw one. One was about uh, supportive uh, mental housing for people living with mental health uh, concerns. Yeah, that's the only I read that. Yeah. So, um, so what? So, if you could put your question into the chat, if you have a question, that'd be great. Feel free also to unmute yourself for a second and ask the question if you've got something. <laughs> Maybe Dee can repeat the question that you wrote in the in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question in regards to mental health issues. Uh, um, my question was, what are the homes, as I've heard it being referred to, as opposed to homeless shelters? Um, what are you doing about the mental health issues that people come into the shelter with? Uh, how are you coordinating services for them or supports to them when they have mental health issues? So the question is, is who is going to answer that? <laughs> is anyone from the shelter well, see, or from mental health here? I could answer that. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Hello? Can you hear me now clearly? Yes. Okay, um, for, from our perspective here, uh, as I alluded to, the, the, the mobile tile unit that we do have, yes, we do have mental issues that do pop up on occasion. Uh, one specific individual is staying there at the present time, and uh, that person is being displaced by the entire fam their entire family. So how do we deal with it? And it all boils back down to networking with uh, community wellness center and we usually refer them to uh, to get assistance uh, from where they are to go to the wellness center and get uh, the necessary help that they do require again it all boils down to networking with what we have here uh, and in the absence of it it's very hard to deal with uh, issues of, of a mental state because I don't have the capacity to do it as a chairman of the board, but what we do have are excellent resources that we refer to people to. Okay, uh, D, it's okay, or do you have more questions, D? <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, I'll probably find out more information about that from other uh, contacts that I have. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you for thank, the answer. Thank you. Um, I want to open a discussion now about after listening this report and the whole information that Louis and Diane share with us. Um, is there any idea and keep building on Louis about that we need to be innovators? So we have here Manitoba Richard Alliance and maybe other people. I see Daniel also was around uh, in the group. Uh, yes, still Daniel Adams is, which is from the government. And anyway, so I want you to, to see, explore ideas. What can we do? What is next? 
maybe. What is next? Because we have a lot of reports, not a lot, but some reports that are very important, very good. So we have now some evidence of the situation. We have we captured the voices of people living on the street. We captured the, the, the voices of people from service providers. And now is what is next? Any idea, anyone want to jump and just share with us some ideas, some points that might be possible, maybe exploration? Okay. Uh, utilizing what uh, it all boils down to utilizing what you have. Um, okay. uh, case in point, okay. uh, the, the example that I, I gave about was Squatum. We had trailers over there, so what we did was we brought the trailers on reserve here and converted that into a, a, a shelter unit for all single people. We have 24 people that live in that unit. The other thing that we need to do is we need to focus our attention on the mere concept of building tiny homes. That's the other avenue. And the, the other thing that we're really pushing right now is people have sawmills within our community and we're hoping at some point in time, those people that have sawmills will start building log homes. Because the fact of the matter is we have to build things to standard, right? Well, we're forgetting about the mere concept of where we came from historically. We built log homes. Hey, why not start from there? You create labor. We, we have a, a youth built international that we've established here in NCN, and that's youth working. These are 17, 18, 19 year olds. And by getting them to work and gain the experience at any trade, whether it be a plumber or an electrician, it speaks very loudly. And all of a sudden, houses will start popping up. But it all boils down because I know a lot of First Nations don't have the money, but how do we be innovative? Well, you have to look at what you have. If you see a, a trailer or if you know of if there's houses or, or ADCO trailers, convert them into a, a unit that we did. And I'm hoping, Leanna, that you receive those pictures so you can share with people. That would be yeah. my mindset. And being it's, in just, a, it's the poor man that's giving me trouble. <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to get them. Okay, but that's what I would suggest. Okay, thank you very much. So now any other idea or how, or how to build on Louis, Louis idea? Any, any comment, any other experiences? I, I know in Nelson House there are very good innovations in terms of housing. So any other comment? Um, I'm wondering, this is Colin. Um, I read a, a recently an article, I think from Lethbridge, that talked about sort of expanding the notion of housing is not just four walls, but uh, they started a weekly sort of gathering that was open to anyone that didn't have any criteria uh, in a downtown center and uh, involved both uh, people that were homeless and also some of the agencies that uh, you know, they were involved with. And um, it sounds from an sort of initial study that that was a very important thing and that people, there was some drumming, there were cultural activities um, and it, it brought forward a, a sense of home um, to some of the people that were involved that it had to leave their own uh, communities, their own land and relationships. That's all. Thank Thank you, Colin. Uh, Leanne, uh, some comments from people are asking about, I don't know if anyone has any response from uh, Colin's comment or uh, aware about this project. Anyway, uh, Leanne, some people have saying that want to see the pictures. The problem is the format is in email and it's upside down. <laughs> and I'm not able to get it to do uh, just at this short stage. Perhaps 
folks uh, leave us uh, their information, I will happily send it to them in an email um, once I can get the format fixed. Yeah, I can send a follow up uh, note to I think most of you probably registered for the session, but if anybody didn't have to put in their uh, email address, if you can do that in the chat, then we'll make sure to uh, send you kind of a follow up with some images and, and the links to the report again. Um, I don't know how much time do we have? Because uh, I was thinking that maybe um, uh, if the MRA can uh, talk a little bit about possibilities to support new ideas in Thompson or Northern communities, at least to what are the possibilities at this time? I don't know if... Um, yeah, well, I can uh, talk as the um, coordinator for the project. I'm a, a resource to help anybody who's interested in uh, any kind of research um, that has to do with kind of a progression of this topic or any others um, in Thompson or the North. Um, the Manitoba Research Alliance supports research um, all over the province and um, we just um, opened up our application process. Um, something that is special or particular about the Manitoba Research Alliance is really focusing on community driven and community based research. So most of the research will be a partnership between um, an academic or student or community researcher and an, an organization. Um, and that point that Lou made about relationships and making sure to connect with people is very much at the core of the project that we fund. So I'll um, share my screen for a little bit so you can see um, the Manitoba Research Alliance website. Um, where um, maybe if you've got a research idea, but you're trying to connect with somebody who can kind of help to, to make it into a project you can apply with, um, you can feel free to contact um, contact me. There's email address, um, and you can put in your email address to keep in the know about opportunities um, in case you're somebody who has research skills and you wanna be connected with somebody who's got an idea for a project. Um, and further, there is a, a ton of research available on the website that you can look through to see what kind of research has happened in the past and more recently. Um, and there's, you can see right here, a resource from NCN about uh, future net zero First Nation. Um, so there's tons of information here to get ideas. And then if anybody has any questions, there's um, me as a resource, but also there are uh, screen leads for our areas of research that can help connect you with people in the community or with academics, depending on what you need for your project. Um, so definitely don't be shy. If there's anybody who has questions in the chat for me now, feel free. Um, and otherwise, uh, just make sure you kind of um, uh, yeah, get those research and get that, as Marlene was saying, what's the next step? How can we um, make sure to find solutions and research sometimes can help with that process, so. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, Leanne, more, what any other things, or Lori, are you going to add anything else? Yeah, I was just gonna say, Andre, you covered that really, really well. Um, but you know, if, if people are interested, there's four basic streams of the MRA under which research gets organized. So um, housing is one of them, but community economic development is one, training and education is one, and justice is one. So those are, those are the kind of streams that the MRA is uh, looking for research on. Um, but as Lou said, innovation is really important. So if you've got an innovative idea if you're keen on doing some research, you'd like to get some support and some funding. Um, yeah, I just encourage you apply to the MRA. It's a very simple application. There's just a, a web um, application kind of form. It's really small, really simple. You just need a project idea and a budget and it will go to a committee that will look at it and you'll get a response quickly, well, like within weeks. So. I just encourage researchers, especially especially researchers in, in the north. Um, I, I think that's a real interest of the MRA. 
So there you go. Thank, nice. thank you, Lori. Um, I'm wondering, I see John Donovan around. And John, are you there, still there? Um, I'm wondering if you can contribute in some way about uh, today. You, I learned a lot from you, and you have been one of the pioneers in terms of working in home, with the homeless people and engage all many of us in working in this area so do you have any talks to men to say it may be the trying to respond the question maybe what is next um i guess what the only thing i really uh thought about today and i'm not sure uh when we talk about transition and having an opportunity uh to network and make sure that people uh, who are in need of housing um, are able to meet a number of their needs, not just to be able to put a roof over their head, because clearly, you know, providing a, an emergency homeless shelter in downtown Thompson isn't meeting all of the needs. It isn't doing enough other than giving them a place to stay, which is ultimately important, but in terms of changing um, their lives in a long-term way, it, it's not going to meet the, the need. And so our, our, our concept of having a Main Street North type of project is still uh, alive and still I think going well. Uh, I know the uh, our community advisory board has been uh, made aware that uh, there is an offer for the UCN facility, the old UCN facility uh, to um, be given uh, to the city of Thompson and the city of Thompson was looking for us to provide some direction and leadership in trying to get uh, a multi-staged facility uh, in that area so that we have an opportunity to not only have an emergency shelter, but to be able to have a transitional program where they can meet their needs uh, or their medical needs, mental health needs, social needs, um, short-term housing and long-term housing, and to be able to do that transition all under one roof and where you have people talking to one another. And as you've said earlier with your research that to give people the respect and to give them an opportunity in the right place uh, in, in the right way to be able to give them an opportunity to make that transition from being on the street to having a place of their own and being able to have a lockstep system where they can move fluidly between all of those stages. And we know that people aren't going to be successful every time and they're not going to move progressively. There's going to be regression, there's going to be progression, and there's going to be lots of, of hoops along the way. And so that's what we're doing right now. Um, it's, I don't know if it's new, but that's what we got. Today. No, no worry. Nothing is new. Well, the, the new has to come. <laughs> the new has to come uh, and see what is next. And I think it's, uh, that may be the biggest question that I want to keep uh, in our minds. What is next? And I try to see how we can... I really engage a lot with Louis, Louis question points about like we need to do a lot. We have to do, but also it's working together collaboratively. But it's not only collaboratively in Thompson. It's collaboratively at different levels in, with the northern communities and south or the federal government. Is working together. It's not only jumping with solution that someone else defined. So I think it's keep working, keep uh, increasing the awareness, keeping. Um, but I think it's a. Uh, I don't know. It's the last word. Lynn, I see you there. Um, I'm trying to put in some people that I I know have been very. And insightful and very contributors for the what happened in Thompson. I don't know, Lynn, you have any say, anything else to want to say? Uh, you mean, do you mean Lynn Fernandez? I, I'm not sure. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> the same person. <laughs> hi, Lynn. Uh, hi, everybody. Hi, Leanne. Nice to see you. It's been a while. Um, it's uh, very interesting to hear about the report. Very interesting to listen to to Lou uh, speak about things from NCN and 
Uh, Lou, we haven't met, but I've worked a lot with Jody Linklater in NCN, and I've worked with Lori. And I'm I'm super interested in 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 the community economic development combined with the um, educational aspect and things that are happening at ATEC. Um, for yeah. me, NCN is just such a dynamic community, and it's fascinating to watch what's going on there. And and Lori. And Shauna McKinnon and I are going to be having uh, further conversations with with uh, Jody about research opportunities uh, in NCN. So we're really looking forward to that. Uh, the one thing that I would I would just point out, and I know there's been some conversation about how how research in the north is going to carry forward. Um, and I've just recently had a conversation with uh, Jeff, and I can't remember his last name, but he's at UCN. And I'm not sure if there's any folks here from UCN on this call, um, but I would I would just I guess encourage all of you to you know to put your heads together as much as possible and maybe not be uh, you know like U of M researchers as well as UCN because I think there's a community up there that seems to be I feel like it's it's trying to come together and organize itself to do the research um, and. So hopefully you can reach out to people like Hank um, and um, his name is Guru. I don't remember his last name, but I think he's VP of maybe research at UCN. So yes, there's definitely is, yeah. some folks at UCN who are trying to figure this out too. So it would be, it would be great if, if, if we could get the different communities coming together and not just be like, not just U of M researchers and UCN researchers, but uh, I spoke to this Jeff fellow, uh, I can't remember his last name, but he's a biologist at UCN and he runs a program um, training, training to a certain extent, quite, quite a few northerners and indigenous students on wildlife conservation. And he was just so interesting to talk to him today. And he's really keen to jump in and, and talk to other people in the north about about uh, training and jobs and uh, and getting Aboriginal students um, graduation rates up higher and getting them into programs where they can find work and find work in the north. So there's just so um, many interesting connections that we should be trying to make with each other. I think uh, it's just all it's all interconnected, as Lou said, and 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 networking and figuring out where where everybody is and what they're doing and making sure that we come together so that we can build off um, each other's work. So that's what I would encourage everybody up there to do. I think there's tremendous um, uh, potential up there for some really interesting research that can make potentially make a difference in people's lives. Uh, so let's let's just make those connections and, and get some of those projects in. Um, and Andre, as we know, will be um, will be happy to happy to help you um, with that, that um, application process. But please don't feel, feel free to also reach out to the research stream heads, as Andre said, um, in terms of developing some of these ideas. Thank Thanks. you, Lynn. Lynn Fernandez. <laughs> I think that's a perfect uh, place to leave it for today. Um, thanks so much to Leanne and Lou and Agnes and Marlene and Lori and Lynn and everybody who's participated to chime in with questions and ideas. Um, as you know, there's a bunch of information in the chat and so I'll save it and hopefully you can uh, take a second to do that. If you click on the three little dots, you can save the chat to save any links um, and information there. But otherwise I'll send a note and you can find, you'll be able to find this report um, on the MRA's website. Um, so thanks so much everybody for participating uh, and have a wonderful afternoon. Stay safe and healthy everybody. Thank thanks, you. Everybody. Thank you, Andre. Okay, bye. Ciao.